Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, Ewan McLeod. Hi, Richard. Great to see you again on the uh, screen. <laughs> it is great to catch up with you. Um, and your exhibition is Figure in a Dissolving Landscape at King Street Gallery on William in Sydney. Um, and it is a tour de force of an exhibition. And of course, we'll come to talking about some of the specific works very shortly. Uh, but first of all, take us, well, take us on a bit of an adventure, because you certainly went on one uh, much earlier <laughs> this year to somewhere which in many ways was the foundation for most of the works in this exhibition. What, what, what happened? Where did you go? We've been planning this trip for quite a while, which was to get a helicopter up to the top of the Tasman Glacier. And I been very interested in doing work based on that area and I just really loved the idea of staying in amongst all the you know the really high crevasse country and um, so that's what we did. So you have been uh, you have been a, a climber you've you've spent a bit of time up up in the um, alpine areas of New Zealand haven't you? I wasn't ever a very good one I've got to say um, I never had that ability to feel comfortable when if I slipped I'd die I mean that was never one of those things and and being a climber you do get into those situations quite often. Part of what um, of what you bring us in uh, some of the works from uh, this trip is that sense of of encountering the elemental of the forces and the, the magnitude of the forces in the environment um, let's go straight to a, a particular work, which I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess I assumed the title was maybe ironic, um, was Easter Break. But yes, it's, it, it is quite ironic when I think about it, because Easter used to be a time when we were young, when we used to go climbing. Um, and it always seemed to be appalling weather, but I suppose it was one of the few times late in the season, I suppose, where um, a lot of the snow was gone, a lot of the ice was gone, so it was a little bit safer. And the whole time we were up there, uh, you're hearing, you know, stuff falling down. I mean, the mountains are growing, they're alive, which I guess is one of the things I just absolutely love about that area is the sense that everything's alive, nature's alive. It's, um, you know, in the, in the dissolving landscape, I think is very clever because it talks about that side of it. Some of the works actually have you producing humans who have become elements in a way. Uh, there's a, mm. an ice man um, and, uh, and, and there's <laughs> another work, White on White, where the figure mm. has become snow itself. Uh, can you give us that sense of how you feel human forms actually start to merge with the environment around them? Well, I suppose that's the kind of key to my work that I've always felt is what it's about. It's about that relationship between the figure and the landscape. And, and if, you know, to coin an old, an old phrase, figure ground relationship, you know, in, in modernism, they always talked about the figure ground relationship. And I always loved that idea. I keep thinking about trying to renew that relationship and, and think about it in a slightly different way. So some of the figures are, uh, almost are the elements you know a lot of the a lot of the larger figures they're sort of they're made of cloud or they're made of snow or they're made of something or other um and often there's a relationship with another figure that you may read as more of a self i might read it as a self-portrait or the viewer hopefully reads it as themselves something else that seems to be a, a very big part of your practice is the process of just looking very carefully, observing and recording and rethinking things. Uh, there are quite a number of studies of various sorts. And when you were talking about the, um, the kind of the tents and the camping and so on, even if to some extent that was imaginary, it was also something that you explored multiple times. Can you, can you tell us about that process of working through a theme with multiple uh, visual studies? There's a, there was a, a, just a lovely process of just not thinking about anything other than just making images. And um, that's often how I'll do it. Then I'll, I'll go through them and a few of them look, you know, they, they look as if they weren't pushing them a bit further. 
you know, it's not like some some of the works on paper, I think, oh yeah, that was a, you know, fun little idea, finish with it. And other ones you look at it and you think, oh, I'd like to push that a bit further. That can go, that can go further. It's almost like you, um, I know you've done rock climbing, Richard, and I, I guess there's certain rock climbs you do and you, you think, wow, I, I really love that. I could have another go at that one. I'd like to try that again and see if I can do it in a slightly different way or, you know, push it a bit further or, mm. um, you know, just just not rely on that or, um, I'm not sure, maybe you'll do it free, free the, the last time, you know, <laughs> don't rely on a rope at all. I'm not sure. Maybe you don't do that. <laughs> Some people do that, I don't know. Some, but that, a lot of people do that. That process that you're talking about of, of distilling or moving step by step towards what you feel is, it may not be an end process, but it's a, a step along the way, seems to happen quite a lot um, for you. And there are good examples in this exhibition. Um, there's the, the work uh, Broken Boat Tasman Saddle and there is a, a sort of a larger uh, version of that but there's also um, a smaller study pretty much of that work. Mm, there's yeah, also a, yeah. another smaller study of another boat with a figure uh, moving towards it. You, you were clearly exploring that idea and then bringing it to a, a, a fruition. And actually, those two paintings was very was just about changing the light source. You know, should I have the light coming this way, and what you know, what what am I going to gain out of that, or should I have the the light source going away from it? And and I I don't ever want anything to be literally correct, but there's a kind of a reality to it. I quite like the fact of having it kind of believable. That's what I always want for someone to look at it and think, oh yeah, that you know, was there a boat up there? There probably was, you know, and it probably would have looked a bit like that because it was, well, no, there wasn't a boat up there. But if there'd been a boat up there, that could be what it would look like. You you were talking uh, a, a little earlier about that process of, uh, of exploring through studies and perhaps staying on a particular theme or in a particular area to understand it better and really inhabit it. And actually, um, uh, the work behind you is perhaps number three of uh, of works that are already in the exhibition. There is a uh, a small work um, called F W, which I'm assuming are Frank Waters initials, um, and then there's a larger version called Campsite, and then there's the work which we see behind you now. Yeah, and that's very much true. And the one behind me. Um... I've decided to keep for myself. I sort of, I, I wanted to keep one of them. I mean, I, it, because it was quite a personal painting, um, very personal painting, actually. And it was, uh, it was a, it was pretty much a kind of a painting, I suppose, painting an emotional place where I felt at that time. The first version I did pretty much the day Frank died. Um, I did a little portrait of him and I did that painting. And uh, at the end of it, I felt, really good about it and felt like I wanted to do it again. And then I did the really large version of it. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it's a nice thing to keep. I mean, you don't, you usually don't get to keep things. Turning to uh, an image or a, a, well, it is a, an image or a metaphor that comes up quite a number of times in, uh, in your works. They're, they're, they're giant shadows. Uh, from some indeterminate being that either somebody looks up and sees or perhaps is unaware of. What, what for you is the feeling, I guess, of the giant shadow? Yeah, I guess it all gets quite personal. I, I've always had this real intrigue about the shadow. I've really had this intrigue. And from, from an early age, I always loved the shadow and drawing the shadow and the shadow bed becoming a kind of a reality in its own. And I guess um, Jung would have all sorts of things to say about the shadow and, um, you know, that I guess in Jungian psychology, it's where you keep all the stuff you don't really want to show the world is the shadow. But um, it's also probably the place where growth happens. I'm not sure. I, I, I think, um, I don't know, I don't know, but it, it does fascinate me. And, and I kind of loved playing with the idea of the, the, the red stain on the snow 
which is like a, a shadow, but it's not a shadow. So I could have two shadows. I could have my cake and eat it too. And, you know, I could have the shadow and the, the red shadow. To a large extent, the rope is probably the strongest metaphor in the show for me. It comes through, it comes about from my experiences climbing where the rope was so critical. And you'd have times where the wind would be howling or, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't hear your mate, but you could feel them on the rope. And they'd give a tug and that meant, you know, start coming up, you know, get, start moving. And that connection was critical to feeling a sense of security. And um, it gave you the ability to do things, you know, to give you a confidence and a comfort that maybe that situation otherwise would be pretty hard to handle. But, but the rope had a huge importance when we were up there because it was an environment, you know, it's been a long time since I've been climbing and, um, you know, I, uh, if I fell down a crevasse, I'm not so sure I'd get out on my own. But, um, you know, we, we took a guide with us. And um, in fact, we'd all been climbing before. We'd been all climbing for, for quite a long time. But it was so good to have somebody there that um, tied the rope on, checked the knot, um, told us what to do. Um, and, and there's a sense of being able to relax and enjoy being in such a hostile environment. We could relax because of that rope because of that connection. Um, and it was fantastic. I'd like to go to uh, maybe move away from the content of the work for a moment to a little bit of the, of the practical nitty gritty, because I note that uh, some of the works and, and even some of the larger works, some of them are acrylic and some of them are oil. And, and I wondered how your decisions about what you like to use and why you like to use it in terms of paint how those decisions are made. I love using acrylics on paper, and if I'm, and I actually took acrylics up with me and paper, and um, because it's very light and easy to carry and e easy to work with, uh, that they took a long time to dry up there. But um, you know, it was very practical. It would have been quite hard taking oils up. But then oils are, are beautiful. They have their own qualities, and and um, people often sort of respond more to the, the texture of the, the, the oil paint and the beautiful luster and the juiciness. I mean, they really are gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous paints. But acrylics, there's something about them I really am, really am enjoying. And um, there's limitations with both. And probably by using both, I'm, um, I'm probably confusing the shit out of myself because I kind of don't, you know, sometimes I'm, painting in oils and I'm painting like they're acrylics and they just don't work. And sometimes I'm painting in acrylics and, uh, and, and it's tricky. But the, the thing that is, I'm really pleased with is that people don't seem to be able to know the difference. They can't tell the difference between the acrylics and the oils. I suppose you can if you go right up close. But from a distance, you know, people will say, well, is that oil or is that acrylic? And um, oh, that's fantastic as far as I'm concerned. Well, that, um, that, kind of, that kind of physical vigour and, uh, and, and the richness of colour that you bring to the works seems to be common to both. How, how, how would you describe your, your, how you feel physically while you're painting? Because it seems to be a very active process. I, I guess that the, the, the thing I'm searching for, uh, and it doesn't happen all the time, is a, is a sense when you're well, that idea of flow when you're one with the work and you, you know there's no there's no separation and you're just not even thinking about it and and often often i'll do that with quite loud music but often lately i've just been with silence just just not having music not having anything in behind and and it's kind of when all of a sudden things are starting to happen in the canvas which um just feel like you're not really in control of, you're not really conscious of, and they're sort of happening and, and you think, whoa, where did that come from? Mm. Um, and, and then you come out of it and then you might try for that again. Um, that, that, that kind of figure coming out of the smoke, um, I, I really wanted that to look a bit like a figure, but also not like a figure. And how do you do that? How do you make something look like something but not look like it? In most of my paintings, there is a kind of a sense of um, a fight, a struggle. 
usually, and I certainly do this when I'm painting on plein air, I, I load too much material onto the stuff, I just really make a mess. And then I try and fight with it to, to pull something out of it. And in that way, I often get something I don't normally expect or can get something I don't normally expect. I'm not totally in control. I'm kind of fighting with something. I certainly noticed when I saw a film of myself painting, I'd never seen it before, that I'm, I actually stabbed the canvas. I'm actually jabbing at it. And um, not delicately painting, I'm, I'm sort of stabbing. And I you know, will often puncture the surface of the, of the canvas, on, um, both with brushes and with um, spatulas and, and scrapers and you know, just go for it. So um, it doesn't look pretty. It's not a pretty sight, but I don't know that if I want it to look pretty, I sort of, I want people to kind of almost feel themselves being in a place like that, of, of being out, out in a howling gale or um, at the middle of the night, crunching along on fresh snow. It's a pretty amazing experience. Mm. Um, that's, that, they're the kind of things that sort of, re that I'd rather, that sort of resonance rather than, oh, it's so beautifully painted, you know, look at the lovely paint. Um, no, my paint's not lovely. Not lovely. <laughs> well, I don't think it's lovely. I don't know. I'd, I'd like to finish up our discussion today um, with the, the title work for the exhibition, Figure in a Dissolving Landscape. Uh, and it's a huge work, more than four metres across, a, a triptych. Um, and, and I'd like to ask you about the decision to make triptychs or multi-panelled works. Um, I, I remember many years ago now going into the boardroom of a, a company somewhere and one of your multi-panelled works was hanging right across the wall and each part of it could have stood alone as an individual work, but the combination produced a, a narrative and, a, and an intensity that was far more than those individual works. So how do you yeah. decide to do that? And with this triptych in this exhibition, how do you decide to, to make that decision? It was a, that is a very interesting question, but it, it's exactly what you say. I, it's that lovely idea of shifting in time and shifting in place uh, between the panels. The original panel, I wanted it to be night. And I was thinking of um, like a kind of a, a campsite, a night campsite. That's what I was thinking. Um, but it just did not work. It just, it, um, it, this, it's, this was going to be the, the central panel, was it? It was, yeah. And originally I was trying to make it work with that. And I just went, endlessly changed it. I've got photographs of, of each stage. And, and then I'd think, oh, I think I've done it. I think I've done it. I've got it. And then I'd look at it later, nah. And, it, and they've got to work, you know, the three have got to, and at the time it looked like three different paintings and they didn't work together. And, and almost at one stage I was thinking, well, I suppose I could just have them as three paintings, but they didn't work for me like that either. And it, that felt like a real failure because the two, two side ones I was very happy with, very, very happy with the sides and they felt like sides. They felt like they were, you know, talking to each other, but, then I thought, well, maybe they could be a diptych, but that didn't work either. Um, and in the end, I kind of thought, well, it might, it probably won't go on the show. It's just too bad. But um, I pulled it off and yeah, I'm really, I'm really, really happy with it. And I, I guess because it was so difficult and so hard to do and so frustrating, there was a real sense of achievement. This is a really important time, I guess, for you both personally and professionally. Uh, with a, a first major solo exhibition in a in a completely new gallery after a, many many years. Yes, incredibly exciting. Actually, you know, there's apprehension. It's been the whole change thing. I've never been comfortable with that. I showed it was for a long time, but King and William have been fantastic, and it's been we did I did have an, uh, an exhibition with them last year with with Luke Scaberis, um Balliol, but this will be my first solo outing. And so far, they've been just so generous and wonderful. And it's uh, the most beautiful exhibiting space. The catalogue is utterly, um, you know, wonderful. I'm really, really pleased about it. So it's a very, very exciting time. Well, this is a tour de force of an exhibition from an artist at the height of his powers. So congratulations. And Ewan McLeod, 
thanks for sharing your exhibition with us. Oh, thank you, Richard. And it was lovely to talk to you. I appreciate it very much.